welcome or welcome back to the Tangerine Knits podcast. My name is Ichi and I'm coming to you from Virginia where I currently live. I love to knit, so this is the channel where I talk all about projects I've recently finished, what I'm working on now, and plans I've got for the future. Today is December 3rd, 2023, so happy December, happy Advent season. This is actually the first year I'm doing an Advent calendar, um, so it has been pretty exciting to, to open that up every day. My boyfriend got me a stitch marker Advent, um, and since it's already day three, I have two that I've already opened up <laughs> um, that are on my whips that I'll show you when I get to those. And later today, I think we will set up our Christmas tree and start decorating the house, so then we'll fu fully be in the festive season. I'd say currently we're we're definitely fully in stick season right now um, and it gets dark at 5 p.m. but you know having a good project to knit on really makes all of that a little bit better so I've I've been loving to you know spend my evenings unwinding to knit um, even if it's cold and dark outside. For today's episode I have several finished objects including a garment um, a item that's been the longest whip of my life. It's been two and a half years in the making, but it's finally done, so I can show that to you. I've got socks, I've got hats, and I've got a new cast on that's a sweater that I'm making for my boyfriend, which it's the first time I'm making a new garment for someone else and has to fit like someone else's body, so I'll tell you the whole saga there. <laughs> but without further ado, we can get started with my first finished object, which is the garment I'm wearing now, and this is the Best number two spring edition by Knitting for Olive. No, by um, my favorite things in knitwear. I knitted this in Knitting for Olive yarns, which is their merino and their soft silk mohair, both in the color blood orange. So I'll stand up a little bit so you can see it better. So my belly button is right here. I'm wearing these high-waisted trousers. I think this is overall a little bit shorter than the previous version that I made, but I think it's all right. I'm happy to have something that fits a little bit differently. This is my second time making this pattern, and the first time I made it, I brought, I brought it to show you as well. This is the first version of the vest number two that I made. It was one of my most worn garment, if not the, wore, the most worn hand-knitted garment that I have, which is su a surprise to me because I had never really owned a sweater vest before and didn't think it was really my thing. But it's just so versatile because you can really adapt it for whatever climate. Um, you can wear it over a white tee and then it's not too hot, not too cold. It's just, I think, a very versatile piece. And I just love the fabric. It looks so luxe and it's also really comfortable. So it just made it really easy to wear and I love the way it looks. So I really wanted another one with a pop of color. So I went for the Knitting for Olive in the blood orange color, which I think is definitely like a really nice red orange. I think in camera, sometimes it looks a little bit more orange, but in person, I think it looks a little bit more red, which I love. I think it's my perfect red orange color. I knitted this a needle size down from what the pattern recommends and I ended up knitting a size medium but ending up with size small measurements which works fine for me. The reason I did this is because the first version that I made I cast it on a size medium but then down adjusted it to make it a little bit smaller than the medium by casting on fewer stitches at the underarm so that the overall bust circumference it's got fewer stitches overall than the medium even though the top half is exactly as a medium. The reason is because I realized that my stitch my stitches were my stitch gauge was a little bit bigger than the pattern called for after I had started knitting it. But regardless, I uh modified the pattern a little bit once I realized that and the fit turned out to be really nice. It is a little bit more oversized and relaxed, but I think it still looks pretty good. But then for this version, I wanted to size down a needle size to try and get the gauge that the pattern asks for because this one is like a pretty loose gauge. And I wanted this to be have a little bit of a tighter gauge just because maybe that's what the fabric is kind of meant to look like. So I sized down a needle size and I didn't do a gauge swatch this time because I figured I'm making the same exact garment in the same exact yarn combination. So my plan was basically that I'll cast on the medium and then as I knit it, check the gauge so that if my gauge was uh, too big, then I can try to modify the pattern again by casting on fewer stitches for the underarm so that it's overall smaller than a size medium. Or if my gauge turns out to be pretty small, then I'll just follow the stitch counts for the medium, knowing that it'll be a little bit smaller than, the, than that for the final garment, and that would totally be fine too. So that was my strategy here. And I think it worked out pretty well. Um, I think one reflection on having knitted the same garment twice a couple of months apart is that I noticed 
that I got a little bit more competent in certain knitting techniques over the past couple of months, which was really nice. When I first knitted this one, I remember talking a bit about picking up stitches for the neck because you know there, was, there were quite a number of stitches that you have to pick up for this V. And that was when I was first kind of learning about uh, how to pick up stitches properly. And it still took me a couple of tries to get the right number of stitches, etc. But I think now having had more experience, I just have a better sense of where you're supposed to put where are you supposed to pick up the stitches from and um, how to keep stitch pick up rate in mind and overall it was just a much smoother experience i remember thinking that picking up stitches was one of my least favorite knitting chores uh, to do but now i really don't mind it and it all went really smoothly so that was kind of nice to see your progress as a knitter when you're doing the same thing kind of twice uh, with some time apart so yeah, this ended up being a really quick knit. I finished it within just a couple of weeks. You know, there are no sleeves. It's a kind of, a, I made it a little bit cropped. I have worn this out a couple of times. Um, the first time I wore it was when I had just finished it and I went to a local cozy hobbies club that a new friend was hosting at a local bookstore. And that was super wholesome and fun. Um, I brought one of the socks that I was knitting on that I'll show you um, in, a, in a bit and Everybody was just kind of doing their own cozy hobby around this uh, t like couch area, uh, seating area. People were crocheting, embroidering, knitting, coloring, and it was it was so nice. I really liked uh, really liked that. So yes, this is my vest number two spring edition, blood orange edition. I think it's kind of also giving tangerine. You know, I don't have a lot of things in this color actually. So yeah, really really love this finished object, and I'm pretty sure I'll wear it just as much as my uh, old one. Oh, I should also say, uh, maybe this is a good time to compare how the fabric has worn. Like I said, I've worn this, I feel like countless times by now. And you can see the fabric. If I stand up, you can see it better. The fabric has worn quite well. Like I said, I think this one might wear even better because it's at a tighter gauge than this one. But this one doesn't look super pilled or anything at all. It is, I mean, the mohair is a little bit matted if you look really closely and maybe it's a little bit more fluffy so I think it probably could use with a mohair brush at some point but I think the fabric holds up really well and it just it looks so it's just such a beautiful fabric and I really love looking at it and and feeling it and yeah really really love this yarn combination okay so now I'll move on to my next finished object which is the massive one so it is it is a blanket. I can't get the full thing in frame. It is called the Diamond Isle Afghan. It's a pattern on Etsy that I'll link in the description box below. But this is actually a crocheted project, which you may or may not be surprised by because looking at it from afar, I feel like this looks a lot like brioche, you know? But I would say that knitting such a large uh, object would have been I think a little a lot more cumbersome than crocheting it because at least when you're crocheting it the hook is free and when you're knitting it this would be just so many stitches that you have to hold on to on your needle so the origin story of this blanket was I guess it was April 2022 I thought it was or May 2022 I thought it was in 2021 that I started it but nope 2022 so about a year and a half ago I was crocheting a lot. I had just recently gotten into crocheting and had been interested in having a large homemade blanket for my couch to cuddle up in and as a home decor item, but I was always a little bit intimidated by it. And then I think one day I just figured, you know what, it's okay if I don't finish it right away, I might as well get started. So I really liked this uh, yarn. This is the Hue and Me yarn by Lions Brand. It's a collab with uh, Two of Wands. This is one of the skeins I have left over. The color is called Juniper. It's a really nice green. I remember choosing this yarn because I really, really loved the color options that it that it had. So I think sometimes, you know, especially like acrylic yarns, the color selection just isn't my favorite. Like the colors aren't as nuanced as I would like. And this I think has really, really nice colors. All the colors actually of Hue and Me I think are really beautiful. So I chose this one. It is a bulky yarn, so it is a bit bulkier than what the pattern called for, but you know, it's a blanket, so gauge doesn't really matter that much. I basically made my first chain 
um, and the first round of stitches to be about the same size as a store-bought throw that I had because I wanted to make it like a proper throw size blanket where you can cover your feet because I hate when a cozy blanket is so cozy but just isn't long enough to cover your feet. So I made sure that I can do that because you cast on along the long edge and then you keep knitting to add width to the blanket. So yes, I basically worked on it pretty diligently for the first couple of months, but then, you know, I started this in May, I think. So then it quickly became summer and the summer is way too hot in Virginia to be working on such a bulky blanket. So I kind of stopped working on it. And then I never showed it on my channel because I really wasn't working on it regularly. I think at some points I worked on it sporadically, especially when I was watching Succession. So I do kind of associate this as like my Succession blanket, but for months at a time, especially like this past summer as well, didn't touch it at all, did not want to touch something this bulky, like I said. And so I think it's sometime in the fall, maybe either right before my last episode or right after, I decided that, you know, it's almost time to get cozy. I really want this blanket finished. And so I just kind of like hunkered down and really focused on finishing it. And of course, when you do that, there's not like you you make progress pretty quickly. So yes, I it was basically on hiatus for a good chunk of time and until I finally decided to finish it recently. I used about 12 and a half skeins of this yarn, I think, and I haven't weighed this blanket yet, but I think based on my yarn usage and the fact that each skein is 125 grams, I'd say it's like one and a half kilograms is how much this weighs. And I think a knitted blanket, it just has a little bit more weight to it, which is really nice and super cozy. And I really like cuddling with it when I'm sitting on the couch. We recently just got a new couch that's a more neutral color. It's like a light gray, beige, grayish color. And it looks really good on the couch and it feels really good when you cozy up on it. I'd seen a lot of knitted blankets being sold at stores like Pottery Barn or something like that, but I'm really glad to have my own version in a color that I like that's been handmade by me. Um, Cost-wise, because I used an, a, mostly acrylic yarn, it wasn't too super expensive. I was just pulling up my shipping confirmation and I think for the total yarn amount that I purchased, it was about $63. So yeah, I'm actually really proud of this uh, finished object just because if nothing else the sheer like massive size of it and how cozy it is and how nice it is to actually get to use I do think it's really clever that the pattern designer achieved this look using crochet because yeah again I think it really looks like a brioche but can you imagine knitting such a large brioche blanket on such a bulky yarn like imagine how many stitches you'd have to have on your needles and how many rows it would have to take to like achieve this this size. I think that would be that would be pretty crazy. And now I'll move on to my other finished objects, all of which are much smaller. The first one I had you had seen half of it in my last video, and that is my cozy autumn socks. I have now finished both of them. So we have two cozy autumn socks um, here. This is knit using Malabrigo Ultimate Sock in the color Caramel. I bought this yarn about a year ago with, I think, this pattern in mind, um, but I never knitted it until this autumn. So I've been loving these. Like I said last time, they have these faux cables, so it's all made using increases and decreases and yarn over, so there's no like actual cabling that you have to do. And the lace went pretty quickly, I'd say. So I really, really enjoy this. I love, I really love this pattern. I think it's just so pretty. So I would definitely recommend it. It's a free pattern too by This Handmade Life. So I'll link that in the description below. I knitted this exactly to pattern. So really nothing else to add here. I even did the slip stitch heel that it calls for, even though I pretty much always like substitute a fish lips cause heel whenever I can, just because that heel is so easy. But yes, these are the, these are the uh, cozy autumn socks and I have, I have them finished. The next pair of socks I'll talk a little bit more about since it's new. I don't think I showed this at all in my last video. And these are the Kigi socks. I'll show just one of them so it's easier to show. Um, but this is the pattern by Yuka. I had heard about this designer from Handmade by Florence who's knitted a number of socks from this designer. And they're all just really beautiful, intricate and unique designs that I've never seen anywhere else. Um, so this cuff looks super cool. It's called a quilted stitch, at least that's what the designer calls it. And I think in the design, uh, the sam one of the samples, she used a different color for this faux cuff as the quilted stitch contrast color. But I feel like when I saw some Ravelry pictures, when you use the same color for the faux cuff and the quilted stitch, it kind of looks like this is one 
one insert <laughs> that has been like fitted through like a lace panel or something like that. That's kind of how I viewed it. So I decided to just use the same color contrast. The yarns I used here, um, again, the main color is Malabrigo Ultimate Sock. This is the color Wabi Sabi, and it's like uh, variegated, or maybe it's tonal. I'm not really sure what the difference is. There's definitely different blues and greens and navies in here. It's really a stunning color, I think, up front and far away. It looks really pretty. And then the contrast color is Focalana Arveta in the color Marzipan. I bought three skeins of these to use as a contrast color. Um, so, you know, since each contrast doesn't use a whole lot of yarn, I think those three skeins will last me quite a while. So I think most of the, most of the contrast white colors you'll see in my socks are probably going to be Focalana Arveta in the color Marzipan. I will say when I first cast it on this sock, I had used a different white. I used the, uh, Cascade 220 Heritage. No, just Cascade Heritage in the color Snow, which is like a very stark white. And at first I had cast it on using that color, but I didn't really like it because it just looked so stark as compared to this kind of like moody, muted color. Um, and I had thought that I would just keep going with it, um, but ultimately the cuff when I first made it ended up being a little too big so I decided like you know what I don't love the contrast and it doesn't fit the most ideal so instead of like falling for the sunk cost fallacy and just like finishing two socks when I don't love the color or the size I might as well just redo the cuff and knit it again so that's what I did and I'm really glad I decided to do that because I think this off-white fits the sock so much better than that really stark white. For reference this is that other stark white that I had been considering and I just don't think this would have given the same vibe as this off-white that I ended up choosing. So I'm glad I decided to cut my losses and just redo the sock at that point. The quilted stitch itself, it's not hard to knit, but you really do have to pay attention. After a while, I got the hang of it and it wasn't too bad. And once you get the hang of it, it's a lot faster. Um, it does involve like slip stitches. And so whenever that's involved, the knitting overall goes a little bit slower, but it's okay. I think overall the look like it's just so cool and intricate. I've never seen anything like this before and I really, really love it. Once again, I did a slip stitch heel. This heel is a little bit different than um, the other like slip stitch heels that I've done before. Actually, I correct myself. This is not a slip stitch heel. This is a heel flap, but it's more like a, it's more like a broken rib type of heel flap, which I never done before. I'd only ever done, the only heel flaps I've ever done is a slip stitch heel. So yeah, this is a broken rib heel flap, which I think looks really cool and I really like it. If you can see that. So the overall construction is that you knit this top down, you start with the quilted stitch cuff, then you finish the foot, and then at the end you pick up stitches to knit this faux cuff that's in twisted rib. It just looks so freaking stunning. I really adore the way it looks. I will say that because the most of the decorative part is on the cuff, when I'm wearing long pants, a lot of times the pants kind of obscure this cuff, so you can't see it super well, but that's okay. I know. I know how beautiful this cuff is. Um, and then on the foot, there's just like a slip stitch rib type of, type of pattern that's pretty simple, but adds a little something something to the sock. So yes, I think this is one of my favorite socks. It's it's extremely beautiful and I really, really love it. And I would definitely be up for knitting another one of Yuka's patterns. It's definitely not like a uh, mindless sock. You do have to pay attention um, to it, but it's just so unique and beautiful that I can definitely see myself knitting some other of her patterns. Okay, I'm back. My boyfriend just came home and he brought a bunch of pastries, so I took a break. <laughs> I also had to charge my camera battery and you know, now the sun has come to join us for our next finished object, so I think it's all gonna work out. <laughs> but my next finished object is a hat. I basically wanted to knit a hat using the same fabric as this vest because I love the color so much, and I ended up choosing the Olay hat by Suzanne Mueller. Um, in making the hat, I also wanted to try a new technique, so specifically I wanted to try half fisherman's rib or half brioche because it's so squishy and I really wanted to see what it would be like to knit something like that. Not gonna lie, I've also been very interested in the Agnet cardigan by Petite Knit, and I wanted to kind of try out knitting something like half brioche or half fisherman's rib to see how I like the stitch before committing to something that's a whole garment full of that stitch. So this was a nice intro to it. <clears throat> it wasn't too difficult to learn. I think there were just a couple of things I had to kind of get used to, but overall, I don't think it was really difficult to get the hang of or anything like that. 
The one thing that I had a tr uh, some trouble with <clears throat> for this hat is the cast on. So I really wanted to make sure I do a tubular cast on. And basically in the pattern, the way the pattern was written, um, because there's so many ways to do a tubular cast on, I wasn't really sure if they were trying to have you do just like a regular tubular cast on or if you needed a special kind that's just for brioche. And so I try to follow the pattern, try to follow the uh, tutorials. And the way they have you do a tubular cast on is you kind of cast on directly on the knitting needle. And that is just, I think I even tried that before, but I just find that to be really tricky. The way for tubular, the way that I do tubular cast ons or provisional cast ons that I feel like is most foolproof is the crochet method, which I'll link Suzanne Richardson's videos below. I feel like that is something that doesn't take much longer, but it's just very stable and I don't think I'm gonna like mess up or drop stitches or anything like that. The one, the version where you put the stitch directly on the needle, I just feel like if you twist it in the wrong way, you've lost some stitches and I don't know how to get it back. So anyway, <clears throat> after some trial and error, I realized that it's just a regular tubular cast on and so then I just did the crochet method and it was just fine. I will say that this tubular cast on um it's not the most tubular i think you do one set of setup rounds like knit one slip one slip one purl one <clears throat> but i think that if you did two rounds or i guess four total rounds it would be a little bit more like more of a tube um i think that would look a little bit nicer because here i mean it doesn't look like a long tail cast on but it also doesn't look super tubular if you can see but it's not super obvious in the grand scheme of things, so I am okay with that, but in the future, I think I'll try and do four rounds. I knitted this pretty quickly. I cast it on at home, and then over Thanksgiving, I finished it, and here's what it looks like on. It's a pretty snug fit. I think I knitted the second largest size, and I sized down needle sizes to two... 3.75. Uh, I think the pattern maybe calls for three millimeter needles and I just don't have three millimeter, three millimeter needles. It didn't come with my Chagu set. So yes, this is what it looks like. And I really like it. I've always loved the look of mohair hats, but I always thought that it's probably going to be too itchy for me on the forehead. But I did test it out with this fabric on my vest. Um, I just put it over my forehead to see what it feels like. And it really wasn't itchy at all. It was perfectly comfortable and so I decided that I would give it a try and I have worn this out before um like yesterday actually I wore this out and it was not itchy at all so it's very comfortable and I just love the way this looks I love this fabric I love how squishy the brioche is I would say this is a little bit pointy at the top um but that might be my own fault because I knitted the hat a centimeter longer than the pattern calls for. So maybe that's kind of why it's a little bit pointy. So if I pull it down, maybe it alleviates that. But it's not a really big deal. It's just kind of being being a bit nitpicky about it. I did block it already, so I don't think it's going to really widen anymore. Although as you wear it, it might get a little bit, a little bit wider. So yeah, this is my hat. As I was knitting it over Thanksgiving, some people, I was wearing this vest as well for Thanksgiving. Um, I got some comments like, oh, your hat really matches your vest. And I was like, yes, it is in fact an exact match because it's the exact same yarns. So yeah, this was overall pretty quick <clears throat> and I really liked it. I did consider making a triple folded brim because I love like a chunky brim, but this brioche fabric is actually so, so squishy and chunky. I know that's what brioche is known for, but I think I didn't quite realize how chunky it is until I had knitted it up. So for reference, um, I'll use this, which is the same fabric. Um, I'll, sh I'll fold the rib in half. <clears throat> and you can compare the thickness of... Let's see. So this is the bottom, the brown uh, fabric is two layers of rib. And then the orange one is obviously two layers of half brioche or half fisherman's rib. And you can see how much thicker it is. So I think the pattern did say you have the option to do like a triple fold brim, but I saw how chunky this already is and was like, that's that's plenty chunky. I don't think I could, um, I don't think I need it to be even chunkier. <laughs> so yeah, I love this hat. I think it'll be a nice pop of color in the winter. And I'm really excited that it's already done. I do still have some of this yarn left over. I have, I think, 46 grams of the merino and then... 16 grams left of the mohair and I think I might want to knit a pair of mittens to match with it. The Olay pattern does also have an Olay 
mittens pattern, uh, which is also in brioche, but I think I might actually just knit the Better Together mittens, uh, which is a pattern that I already have. I knitted it last year, but using one strand of a superwash sport weight wool. And I liked the design a lot, but I think if I used mohair, it would look totally different. I think at that time last year, I wasn't really sure if mohair was for me, but this year is just me discovering how much I love mohair. And so, yeah, I think if I knitted that same pattern with this mohair, um, it would just basically be a totally different look. And it would be nice to kind of, kind of have a two like coordinating, not matching, but coordinating sets of mittens and hats. So I think I'll probably work on that. I will say I'll, that'll probably be a little bit of yarn chicken because technically I think people use like 18 grams of the mohair for the mittens, but I'll try and figure something out and see. I think I can make do without the two extra grams, but yeah, here is my orange hat with my orange vest. I don't know if this looks ridiculous to be worn together. I don't think I would do it, but you know, it is a possibility. All right, I fixed my hair just in time to talk about another hat, which I will put on to mess up my hair once again, but that's okay. The second hat I wanted to talk about that I finished is the Weekend Hat by Hiromi Nagasawa. I actually knitted this hat before I knitted this orange one because I was trying to decide what pattern I wanted to use for this orange yarn. And one of the ones I was considering was the Weekend Hat by Hiromi Nagasawa because on the pattern Ravelry page, the sample is knit using like a gorgeous orange color. But I wasn't sure if I was into this cable look for me, so I figured I'd knit this using stash yarn and decide if I like it, and if so, I can use this orange yarn, and if not, um, you know, I'll use a different pattern, which I, is what I ended up deciding to do. But I will say I do still quite like this uh, pattern. So this is knit using two strands of yarn. One is the pa Juniper Moon Farm Patagonia Merino in the color ivory, which is left over from my Lume uh, pullover. And then I also held it with one strand of Juniper Moon Farm Harriet Fine, which is a lace weight, 75% alpaca, 25% nylon yarn that I use for my Joya cardigan. And I figure this, these two yarns made sense because it's basically one strand of wool plus one strand of lace weight alpaca. And I think, you know, holding yarns with the Isayer Alpaca One is pretty popular at the time. I, I'm noticing a lot of people doing that. And so I wanted to see what that would look like here. I also felt like the ivory was a little too yellow and the white was a little too thin. So holding them, and the alpaca was too thin. So holding them together, I thought might bring it a couple shades brighter. This was really inspired by my color mixing that I did with the fluffy drops brushed alpaca silk plus the lace weight Malabrigo wool um, in my previous video that I talked about for my cumulus blouse. Um, I really liked how mixing two very different colors resulted in a new color, so I thought maybe I could try it with this. I do think this is a little bit more marled than the cumulus blouse looked because the alpaca, it while it does have somewhat of a halo, it's nowhere near as fluffy as the mohair, so they don't blend quite as well as the cumulus blouse. So that's a good learning. Um, overall, I think the color looks all right. It's it's still like very marled um, and it kind of reminds me of cornmeal or cornbread because of the white and the yellow. Not that it's a bad thing, but yeah. The, the fabric itself, I think, is maybe not like my favorite color, but that's okay. I did it as an experiment. I also feel like the stitches are very uneven. I know that rib, you know, can look pretty uneven depending on how well you knit it, but I feel like looking at it closely, the way that the yarns like don't really mesh together kind of makes it a little bit lumpy <laughs> as compared to like, you know, holding wool with mohair. Um, I don't know if this is true with like the actual 100% alpaca, like I say, or alpaca one. I think that that probably makes the yarn quite smooth. But when I look at this closely, it looks like sometimes the alpaca nylon blend that I used just kind of like juts out separated from the merino. So yeah, I don't know if this is like, yeah, the best yarn combination that I've ever chosen. Um, but again, that's okay. It's just uh, stash busting and experimental. The other thing I experimented with was to knit a hat from the top down. So this pattern itself actually calls you to knit from the cuff up, but I didn't really have that much of the merino left. I think I had almost the exact yardage needed by the pattern. So I knew that there is a chance I'm cutting it too close and I didn't want to get to the crown and not have enough to finish um, because the crown is decreased in pattern sort of. So you kind of, you couldn't just like stop mid crown without getting a flat part at the top. So I decided to just knit the chart upside down. 
Um, and for the cable, you just have to switch. If it says cable front in the front, you just cable on the back or cable, yeah, cable from the back and vice versa to make sure you still get the same pattern when you knit it upside down. And then for the increases and decreases, I just was mindful of whether the pattern called for a left or right leaning decrease and then did the corresponding increase to make sure it's still lined up. And I think overall it looked really good. It's totally still in pattern. And I really liked that option for when you think you might run out of yarn because like I said, getting to the brim and knowing, okay, it's time to stop and bind off and making the brim a little bit smaller or a little bit longer than you need to is still better than getting to the crown and not having enough yarn. So the other thing that I wanted to practice with this hat is cabling. So this is the most like density of cables I've knitted in a project, I think ever. Um, I had knitted the twist loop top by Other Loops. It's a tank top that has one central cable down the front. So it's not like a lot of cabling that I had to do. And then I think I knitted a cabled hat when I was, when I was very like first starting to learn to knit, but there were just so many knitting techniques that I was trying to wrap my mind around that the whole experience was kind of a blur. So I decided to do, uh, to do this and it, I did use a cable needle for this. I've since learned to cable without a cable needle, which I think I enjoy a little bit more, but yeah, I used a cable needle the whole time through. And I also did practice laddering down to fix a cable mistake because I just genuinely made a mistake and I basically cabled in the wrong direction so that instead of getting these nice shapes that I think look like antlers, I got like a big circle. I'll try and just put a picture of one if I can find it. And so I just laddered back to fix it. Um, I didn't even watch a video actually on how to do that because I just figured I would just, you know, drop a bunch of stitches and just knit it back up the way I normally would knit it up if I were following the pattern properly. And I think it mostly worked out and blocked out. I think when you're knitting it back up via like laddering, I end up pulling the neighboring cables a little bit. So then there's some slack in the yarn that maybe wasn't already there, that wasn't initially there. So yeah, most of it's blocked out, but if I can pick out some of these cables, you can still kind of see that maybe this one, it's not as neat as its neighbors because I was laddering down. Um, but yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's still better than just unraveling much of the hat. <laughs> so yep, I think in the end my hat was slightly bigger than the pattern, but still fits pretty nicely. Um, like I said, I think because of the fabric color and the quality of the yarns not melding together, like it just doesn't look the most polished. I also ended up doing a um, just regular bind off because it's a two by one rib at the brim and I don't think that there is a way to do a sewn bind off with two by one rib. I know that if it was two by two rib, you can just rearrange the knits and rib, knits and pearls to be knit one pearl one, and then you can do a regular sewn bind off, but I didn't think there was one to do it here. I also learned that I definitely prefer a folded brim. I mean, obviously like this is not gonna work. It's way too small now, but I just think I don't really like hats that don't have a folded brim. So there's that. And of course, because it's two by one rib, the wrong side doesn't look the same anyway. So I couldn't have, even if I had the yarn, I couldn't have knitted it long enough to do a folded brim, even though maybe I was kind of hoping that I would have enough yarn left over to do it. Um, I mean, I didn't, but it's okay. I think I would still keep this hat around just as a hat to throw around and not really worry about if it's gonna get messed up or anything. Um, but I do overall still really like the pattern. So I would recommend it. And I actually do have plans to knit another one. Um, I'll show the yarn that I got in the acquisition section so yep overall recommend the pattern learn a lot from knitting this hat won't use this yarn combination again um but yeah oh i should maybe clarify like i don't i i'm still interested in trying holding yarn with like a lace weight alpaca lace weight 100 alpaca like you say or one i'm still very interested in doing that it's just that the juniper moon farm patagonia or no the juniper moon farm harriet fine which is like alpaca and nylon blend i think that particular yarn doesn't work super well when held with a merino like this one in my opinion um and i did want to know that because i have a good amount of that yarn left so i had considered holding it as a fluffy strand to add some halo to my projects but um i don't know i'm not sure that i'll be doing that actually so that's overall a very good learning so that's it for my finished object and the first whip that i have is a cardigan. Um, I showed this as a swatch during my last episode, but the lighting was pretty bad. But today you can, I made, it, made a good amount of progress on this cardigan and you can see the fabric a little bit better. The yarn is two strands. It is the Norrell Silk Garden Sock Solo in the color Ome, which is T82, held with the Isayer Silk Mohair in the color 62. 
I did consider holding this with a white, but the store when I went to buy this was out of white. So I just went with the rose to really double down on the pinkness of it. And then together, I think it's a really, really nice color and it has all of these different multicolored speckles, I guess, within the fabric. And it's so fun to knit. When I come up to like a neon little bit of uh, yarn, it's just like, it's just super exciting. It's like watching watching a rainbow <laughs> um, come pass you by. So I have really, really enjoyed knitting up this fabric. The pattern that I ultimately chose was the champagne cardigan. I was kind of debating which pattern to use in my last video and I had asked you all for some feedback. And then some people were telling me like, go for the champagne, um, You like maybe you've knit one and you really, really loved it. And then also I've got some good recommendations for other patterns as well, such as this drops cardigan, which is exactly the same stitch gauge that I had achieved, as well as the uh, Zokuri cardigan, which I also really, really liked and have an eyeing. And um, ultimately I decided to just go with the champagne for this one, but I do still think I want to knit the Zokuri cardigan, but just not in this color and this fabric. I think that one is more casual for, to me. And then this pink is a little bit like, extra at least for me so I decided to just knit like a really simple polished you know cardigan to let the fabric shine so thanks again for all of you who gave me advice on which cardigan to choose um, I really appreciated hearing your thoughts so yes this is ultimately the champagne cardigan and I have already split uh, split for sleeves and now I'm just on the body so it's just kind of stockinette going all the way around um, the pattern has been really straightforward to knit. I feel like there was really nothing uh, dramatic or traumatic about this like project at all. It's been going pretty quickly. And like I said, I've been really loving this yarn combination. So maybe I don't have too much else to say about it besides that I'm really excited to have this finished. And yeah, this is also kind of something I'm, use I'm using to gauge whether I like like big mohair pieces. So I know I was just talking about how I've started to love mohair, but the only mohair pieces I've really knit are like two of these vests and then the hat. So I haven't knitted like a full garment out of a thicker weight mohair, a thicker weight wool plus mohair. So I'm my big concern is that it's going to be too warm to like realistically wear out and about. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. The Silk Garden Sock Solo is technically... Um, a sport weight and it's also only 40% wool and it has 10% mohair, mohair, the rest being silk and polyamide. So this probably won't be as warm as like a similar weight, 100% wool. Um, so maybe it's not going to be the most informative in that sense, but I'm hoping that this would still be pretty wearable and not be like overwhelmingly warm to wear. So yeah, this is my champagne cardigan in progress. Oh, and I did mention that I had the stitch marker advent. Um, this is December 1st. It is a cute little butterfly. So I've put that onto here as a stitch marker. Um, I haven't knitted on it a whole lot. You can see that there's only like maybe an inch and a half of fabric, uh, fabric that I've knitted since December 1st because I've been spending all of my efforts on the next whip, which I'll show you. Um, but I also wanted to point out that these stitch markers are closed. Like they're meant to be used as stitch markers, but I wanted to use them as progress keepers. So I just attached it to like a light bulb pin that I already had, which does take away from the beautifulness of the stitch marker, but you know, it makes it more functional, so that's what I'm doing for this. All right, the lighting may have changed again because my battery died and I had to wait for it to charge, but hopefully this battery will take us to the end with no problem. Um, I was on uh, works in progress and I'm going to show you my next work in progress, which is an exciting one. This is the Seaway pullover. This is the sweater that I'm knitting for my boyfriend and it is a pattern by Ozetta. So this is a drop shoulder sweater where you knit the back using short rows to shape like a trapezoid. And then when you're done with the back, you pick up along the cast on edge for the front to left and right shoulders. Um, and then you connect them by casting on for the collar opening, then you continue to knit the front and then eventually you join the front and the back. So I'm now at the stage where you're knitting in the round. Um, I actually have two of these because this is the one that I knitted at first and this is going to need to be frogged, but 
kind of hurts to frog something that you made, uh, that you made, especially when you made quite a bit of progress. So I'm just kind of delaying the inevitable. Um, also, this is already nicely blocked. So I figured I can also show you this as a comparison to see what it looks like after the fabric has been blocked, which is all nice and smooth as opposed to this one that's a lot more crumply because it's not been fully blocked. So the main draw of this pattern are these cables that are throughout the sweater all over the sweater like on the sleeves and everything where it kind of looks like ripples on an ocean i'm not sure if that's exactly why ozetta named this the seaway pullover but that's what it reminds me of and it also looks really coastal to me not just because of the the ripples but also because the color that i used um, reminds me of white sand beaches so it definitely yeah is giving that coastal vibe so um, let me tell you the full story of how we ended up choosing the sweater and why I have two of them um, and, you know, have this false start over here. So basically, I have been wanting to knit a sweater for my boyfriend for a while now. I first mentioned this in my 2023 knitting plans video that I made back in January. And it took me a while to actually cast one on because I wanted to just get more experiences knitting sweaters for myself. So I have a better sense of the construction, um, the fit, how you can modify certain sweaters and also like what type of yarns that that work well and this year i felt like i was finally ready to kind of to kind of tackle this big project and the first step was of course to pick the yarn and pick the pattern and that was not as easy as it sounds so i will say my boyfriend is very knit worthy i've knitted him a hat and two socks all kind of as surprises and he loves them all he wears them a lot and he's the kind of person who just really appreciates and values like the amount of time that it takes to make something for someone else so it's really nice to knit for him but he wanted to be really conscientious about what pattern we chose and what yarn we chose so that it's something that he would actually want to wear so i showed him a ton of options for patterns and yarns um and understandably i think he got a little bit overwhelmed with the sheer amount of choices that are out there um, because even for me, someone who's like fully immersed in the knitting world and has this background knowledge about yarns and patterns and what have you, it still takes me quite a while to plan my project. So understandably, it was just like a lot of information. Um, so basically, at first, the option we thought we'd go with is to use the sweater number 14 pattern, which I'll show here. It's a very simple drop shoulder sweater pattern. And I know it's a woman's pattern, but it's like a very boxy fit. And even I did look at some men's specific patterns, like the ones that Petite Knit has. She has quite a few. Most of hers look a lot more fitted, which I think is more common among men's patterns that I've seen on Ravelry. But my boyfriend's style is more like that oversized boxy fit. So the sweater number 14 actually fits it's that vibe a lot better. I've also seen some other men wearing that sweater on Instagram. And I think that Jean from Jin Jin Knit also knitted this pattern for her boyfriend and that seemed to have fitted well. So that's initially what I was going with. And then because it's such a simple pattern, we would want to use like a, like some, a yarn with some interest because for the sweater, I really wanted it to look kind of special, you know, like, um, yeah, either with the yarn or the sweater where it doesn't just immediately look like something that you could buy at a store and like a fast fashion store or something like that because it was going to take me a long time to, to make it. So the yarn that I had considered using was kind of like one strand of tweed plus one strand of alpaca um, or maybe even this combination with the knitting for all of merino and mohair but i was just too afraid that the mohair would be too itchy or too warm for him so that's kind of why i leaned against it even though he does really like the way this fabric looks and so i did try to show him a lot of yarn uh, and yarn combinations but i think it's just a little bit difficult to get a sense of what that's going to look like because i was asking him to get a sense of the overall project uh, the overall product which would include the pattern the yarn and the color but I was having him look at like one picture for the pattern a different picture for like an example of the yarn combination but then imagine it in this other color so all of that was getting to be a lot and especially if I wanted to hold two yarns together it was just going to be well, I wanted to hold the two different yarns together so there's like an interest to the fabric, but in order to do that, the color is also going to change a little bit. So in the end, I decided it got a little bit too overcomplicated and that I would rather just use like a simple tried and true yarn, but pick a pattern that has a little bit more interest. So I showed him this Seaway pullover by Ozetta and he really liked the way that looked. And he also liked the color a lot. What I decided to do was um, to use the Cascade Eco Merino DK because I had just finished a... Uh, the Amy slipover 
which I talked about in my last video using that yarn. And I thought it was extremely soft. It's like almost kind of velvety. It blooms super nicely. So it's really not itchy for me at all. And then it, the fabric itself also looks really nice. Like it looks kind of luxe because of the fact that it's like a woolen spun yarn that blooms super nicely. And I did already have some, like a sweater quantity in stash in the color Sandy Beach, which I will show you. Okay, so this is the Sandy Beach color for the Cascade Eco Merino DK. I had gotten this to knit the Hete sweater, um, but I don't know if I'm going to knit that one anymore. So I just have this on hand. And the issue though is I think this color is a little bit too yellow um, for me and also for my boyfriend. So while I really like the color, like the, the quality of the fabric, I think this color wasn't quite it. So um, because he really liked the picture of Ozetta's sample, I looked for the options that this yarn comes in that is kind of similar to that and landed on Silver Mist. And if you look closely at Silver Mist, it kind of looks like it's uh, two colors of yarn plied together. So one is silver and the other is more beige. And so overall it looks kind of like a grayish color. So I think gray isn't typically my thing, but even on my skin tone, I think it looks pretty nice um, because it's not just like a cold gray. It's definitely a very warm neutral gray. And I think it's a really nice neutral color. And I love the way the cables all look as well. So I think this was a good selection of yarn. It's, I've had my boyfriend try it on uh, briefly and he also thought that it wasn't itchy. So that was really good news because nobody wants to wear an itchy sweater and I didn't want to burden him with an itchy sweater that he would feel like he has to wear, uh, or he would feel like he really wants to wear, but doesn't want to. So I don't think that would be a problem here. So um, let me explain why I had to make it twice. So this is actually not due to lack of swatching. I swatched, I swatched three times in fact, because I was using a different yarn than what the pattern called for. And um, because the pattern itself has like a, a pattern repeat, so I couldn't just, you know, add two or three stitches to change or decrease two or three stitches to change the size. I had to increase or decrease by increments of the pattern repeat. Um, and so it was kind of more important to get the right, to not only make sure that my swatch gauge has uh, a density of fabric that I liked, but also that it achieves the right gauge that would give me the right bust circumference. So the bust circumference that I wanted to go for, um, the way I determined that was I measured two of Matt's favorite sweaters that he likes the fit of, so I can kind of have a target range of bust circumferences that I want. And that put him actually in between the size two and the size three. And so because of that, I figured that I could either, you know, go for a, a, a gauge that's bigger than the pattern. And so I can knit the size two to, you know, in the end achieve a bust circumference that's a little bit bigger. Or if my gauge was significantly smaller, which was not really expected due to the yarn, then I could knit the size large, uh, the size, three and then um, make sure the garment comes out a little bit smaller. You know what I mean? So like adjust the gauge so I can get an in-between size. So <clears throat> I swatched three times in order to like figure out what gauge I needed. Um, and I landed on a 3.75 millimeter needle, which should have gotten me the exact bus circumference that I was going for. So you might ask, well, Ichi, you went through so much effort to calculate and to swatch. How come it still went wrong? Well, <laughs> the reason is so dumb, but basically I used the wrong needle. <laughs> I did all this work to determine that I needed a 3.75 millimeter needle. And then I didn't realize until I found out that this was too small that I had been using a 3.5 millimeter needle. And I don't even know how it happened. Maybe I was just like casting on so many projects at the same time that I just miss like grab the wrong needle misread it like maybe 3.75 I just read it as 3.5 I don't really know what the reason was but it's a very very silly reason to have messed it up especially since I had even like figured out <laughs> what is the right size that I should use so that was extremely dumb <laughs> but um you know at least I had the wherewithal to stop and block the sweater at this time in order to like really cut my losses and not go on any further. So basically when I had gotten this far and joined the front and the back, um, I measured it, saw that it was pretty small. Then I was like, okay, it'll block out. I blocked it, it's still pretty small. And then I kept like fiddling with the fabric thinking maybe I can just stretch it out and it would be the right size. But ultimately decided to stop deluding myself and just, you know, again, like not buy into the sunk cost fallacy and just 
start over and knit it properly so that I don't end up with a fully knit sweater and realizing it's too small. So that's basically what happened here. And like I said, I'll need this yarn to finish the sweater, so I'm going to frog it, but can't bring myself to do it just yet. So yeah, I think now it should be smooth sailing. I made a good amount of progress on this sweater already. This is the armhole opening. Oh, I did modify the pattern a little bit by... Um, by making the armhole opening bigger. So basically after I had knitted the uh, like the front and the back according to the size two pattern, I held up this armhole opening against the sweaters, the reference sweaters that he already has. And I found that this was just a little bit small. And so I decided to just knit another pattern repeat before I joined the front and the back so that the pad, the like the armhole opening is a little bit bigger and in fact the armhole opening should match size medium which is important because i'll have to follow the size mediums um not size medium size three i had to follow the size three's instructions for knitting the sleeves because the sleeves going this way also has the pattern repeat so it has to have the right amount of stitches um that's in increments of the pattern repeat you couldn't just be like oh i have two extra stitches for the sleeve it'll be okay I mean, I think you probably could fudge it at the underarm, underside of the sleeve, but um, in this way, I, I shouldn't have to. And then the other modification I'll make is I think the pattern has more of a funnel neck, but I'm pretty sure I'll fold it down as a folded collar because um, it's, it's a men's sweater. I mean, I guess I can ask what he thinks after I knit the, the funnel neck, um, but I'm pretty sure I'll just make a folded collar. But yeah. That is it for the Seaway uh, pullover. I'm not sure if I'll finish it before Christmas. So today is December twenty, uh, December 3rd. And I have, I'd say maybe half the body done. I can't really tell because I think because it's a men's sweater, it'll be longer than the sweaters I make for myself. Um, and then of course I'll have the sleeves and the collar. So we'll see how long it takes me. I would really like to finish it before Christmas, but I don't think I'm gonna like go through too many trials and tribulations to make sure it's done because um, I still want to like enjoy the process. So yeah, this is my Seaway pullover. Next up is a sweater that I've kind of pulled out of hibernation. I started this back in the spring, I believe, and then the weather got warm and I decided that I didn't want to knit on a wool sweater anymore. Um, but then recently I started to pick it up again. This is a terrazzo, um, terrazzo sweater by Petite Knit, and I'm knitting this out of Phil Kalana Peruvian Highland Wool in the color Fisherman Blue. And I did modify it a little bit, like instead of the turtleneck, I wanted to do a folded collar. So here's the folded collar that's not yet been um, folded down yet. And uh, yeah, I chose this pattern because at the time I had never knitted a saddle shoulder. Um, and so I just wanted like a casual elevated sweatshirt type of sweater that I can wear and I wanted to try the saddle shoulder construction, so I picked this one. And I think I had finished up to the like the body ribbing when I had put this on hold. And then so recently I just finished uh, the sleeve. And this is where I'm not sure if I should keep this project because the sleeve is just a little tight. I'd say overall, I wish the sweater was a little bit bigger. I did cast on a size medium, um, but I think this is one of her earlier patterns where there isn't a whole lot of positive ease built in. And so if I wanted like a large amount of positive ease, I probably should have sized up two sizes as opposed to just one size. So anyway, the sleeve is a little bit fitted. Like it's not tight by any means and it's not like up to my armpit or anything. It's like, I think overall the fit is nice. I just wish it was even looser. So I do think that if I had just not done any sleeve decreases, it could have been alleviated. So overall, I would say the fit is still like pretty nice like it's a lot nicer than I had thought that it would be um just the magic of patina knit patterns I suppose but I think again I wish the sleeves was just a straight sleeve with no decreases that would make it look a little bit more relaxed and then also I just felt like everything about this sweater is good but nothing that really is special or sparks joy like the yarn feels nice um the color is nice but I'm not crazy about it the fit is nice but I'm not crazy about it and so I just feel like I'm not really picturing a situation where I would like be really excited to wear this sweater, even if I were to finish it. And so because of that, I'm wondering if I should just frog it and knit something else. Like for example, I really like that Seaway cardigan or the Seaway pullover. And I feel like given this color, which definitely reminds me of the ocean, it would be kind of cool to have a Seaway pullover 
that's shaped like, that's in this color, you know? So I am really considering that. I think I'm not gonna like hurry to frog it at this time. I might wait and see. Um, in fact, maybe I'll try this on so you can see what it looks like. I mean, there's obviously missing a sleeve, but I'll try it on for you. Okay, here it is on. And I think once I block it again, this sleeve opens up a little bit, but you can see like the shoulder actually looks quite nice and the overall fit is pretty good. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I just don't know if I'm like crazy about it, you know? So I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> Should I keep this? Should I just wait? Should I make a Seaway pullover out of this yarn instead? We'll see. Um, yeah, I'm not in a rush to like come to a decision here. I can just let it sit for a little bit longer, but this is becoming kind of a pretty lingering, lingering whip. I'm not really sure what to do with. All right, I changed back into my slip over to go through my last whip, I think, which is getting into the Christmas spirit. It is a Christmas sock. This is knit using the West Yorkshire Spinners signature four ply in the color Holly Berry. I'd gotten this, I think, way back in July because I was buying something and needed something else to bring me over to the free shipping threshold. And I figured I knew I wanted to knit a Christmas sock and I really like this colorway, so I might as well just go ahead and buy it. <laughs> um, so here, here it is. The pattern I used... I should say this is where it kind of like incorporates a pattern rather than uses a pattern, but I incorporated the pattern uh, for the Gersty sock, which is in the 52 Weeks of Socks book that I've had since last Christmas. This was a Christmas gift that I got last year from my boyfriend's um, parents, which I was really grateful for and I was so excited because there's several patterns in here that I want to make and have plans to make. For some reason, I just hadn't casted one on yet, um, or cast one on yet. I just realized that that word, there's no, the, the past tense of cast is actually just cast. It's not casted. So uh, I've been trying to catch myself saying cast instead of casted. Regardless, I had not cast anything on yet in this book. And I really want it to before the year ends. Um, and so I thought I would use the Gersty sock because, you know, this is a self-striping yarn. So I wanted something that, would let the yarn itself itself shine, but I wanted a little bit of interest beyond a vanilla sock. And I thought that the vertical like rib uh, stitches in the Gersty sock kind of reminded me of icicles. And I thought that would be really nice. And so I did start doing that. Um, I should also say I modify the pattern because I brought this yarn to knit on during Thanksgiving when I was at my boyfriend's family's house. And we I didn't bring like my contrast yarn or anything. So I just... Uh, wanted to knit from the cuff down because I knew I wanted to make a contrast, uh, contrast toe. And I decided to just, you know, knit the sock backwards so I can knit it cuff down instead of toe up. But that's pretty minor. Um, and I flipped it inside out because the Gersty sock, as written in the pattern, is actually the inside of my sock. So ignore all these ends, but this is a whip, okay? So don't judge me. I will weave these in when I'm fully done with the sock. Um, so this side is the Gersty sock and you can see the knitted rib stitches. And I don't think it looks bad. I just felt like it looked a little bit busy on this self-striping yarn because of the, the short repeats, especially in this green and white section. And so I was a little bit discouraged at first because I already knitted maybe like half of the cuff when I realized I didn't love the way this looked. Um, also because this is primarily knitted in reverse stockinette. So you're purling the vast majority of the stitches when it comes to this. And because I had to go through all that and I wasn't a huge fan of the way it looked, I was kind of just like, why? <laughs> and I should say, I don't have anything against purling. I really don't like hate purling or anything, but all the other projects that I was knitting on, um, I should say most of the other projects I was knitting on was like a lot of purling, like the cardigan and the um, seaway pullover before I joined the front and the back. And so I just wasn't really looking for an excuse to purl more when it didn't really have a payoff. So I was like, well, what should I do? Should I use a different sock um, pattern? But then I flipped it inside out, flipped the Gersty sock inside out and looked at the wrong side and figured that I actually really liked it. I mean, there are these kind of like um, furrows where the knit stitches on the wrong side pops out. Um, on the on this side, it's kind of like furrows. And this kind of reminds me of tree bark, you know, um, when they're furrows, but they're not super aligned all in one vertical column. They're kind of offset. I thought that that went pretty well also with the theme of holly berry, like tree bark. And so I decided that I like this a lot. So I'll just continue with the sock and knit it 
and use this, uh, the wrong side of the Gersey sock as my right side. So um, that's what I did. I did continue to knit the cuff using the Gersty's instructions because I, um, I just didn't want the cuff, the leg to look like there's some major discont discontinuity. But then by the time I finished the leg, I did a, a fish lips kiss heel, which is not called for in the pattern. I think there's like a heel flap and gusset or short row heel. I can't really remember what's in the pattern itself, but there was a lot of instructions and I was just gonna <laughs> knit something simple and move on. So I knitted the fish lips kiss heel. And then after that, I did a turn so I can knit the rest of the foot like inside out according to the Gersti so that I can primarily knit instead of primarily purl. Um, I could have done a German short row to avoid the hole when I did the turn to switch from knitting in this orientation versus this orientation, but I, like, because of the fish lips kiss heel, you have these twin stitches at the end, and I wasn't sure if the German short row stitches are going to mess with that, so just to be safe, I just did, like, a regular turn, knowingly creating a hole that I then just sewed up, and I think this is the side that has the hole that's been sewn up. And you really can't tell. I just sewed it up with the, the yarn tail. So that was totally fine. Um, but in the other sock that I'm going to knit, the second sock that I'm going to knit, I'm just going to knit it like with this side as the right side to begin with. So I don't have to worry about the turn. Um, the contrast color, once again, is Filcolon Arvetta and the color Marzipan. Like I said, that's just my go-to contrast color because I have a lot of that yarn. And I do like the way it fits. Um, I You can see the stockinette like... Yeah, the stockinette pattern on the foot, on the bottom of the foot, I guess the sole, um, it looks like this. And then the other side has the pattern. Um, I think the pattern does add something, but I also think I actually quite like this vanilla sock stockinette pattern as well. So my plan is I'll knit the second sock identically to this, and then I should have enough yarn to knit a pair of socks for my boyfriend as well, so we can have matching Christmas socks. And then for his socks, I'm just gonna do the vanilla one. Um, so yes, that's that's what's upcoming for me with Christmas sock knitting. I'm really excited about this. The yarn so far feels great. I've tried this on and it feels really cozy and wooly and warm and yeah, I really like it so far. I have heard mixed reviews about how, wear, how well it wears, but honestly, none of the socks I've knit seem that bulletproof and I'm okay with it because, you know, I can always shave the sock, like deep the sock and it's a sock. So I don't totally mind that sock yarn pills a bit. So we'll have to see how this goes. So that's it for works in progress. I know I was like so excited to cast on my wall garden wall garden pullover um, from last episode, but honestly, I've been a little bit like cast on shy with that one. I did make two swatches and I'm still trying to decide between two needle sizes. Maybe I can show you the swatches. So yeah, these are the two swatches that I made. Um, this one, this one is using a five millimeter needle and this one's using a 4.5 millimeter needle. They honestly look pretty similar and the gauge that I achieve is also pretty similar. Um, I think it would be safer to use the, the larger uh, needle and because like the color work is going to make it tighter. That's also what Athena from the Seedling Stitch podcast recommended based on her experience knitting her sweater. Um, but I don't know. I just like had a hard time deciding. And I think also because the pattern will take a lot more brain power to figure out how to knit because it's in Japanese. Um, I just haven't really done it yet. I think I will still try and focus on the Seaway pullover um, to just try and finish it before Christmas if I can. So um, I don't know if I'll work on this a ton, but I really, really do want to cast it on. So maybe I should make that a goal just to like cast it on, you know? So that's the very brief update on that. Um, last I'll talk about acquisition. So the first thing that I, d I bought was the yarn for the Seaway pullover. So you already saw that. It's the Cascade Eco Merino DK in the color Silver Mist. And then in the same order, I got this Barocco Ultra Wool, which is 100% superwash wool. I think it's in a worsted weight. I think it's in a worsted weight. Um, and I'm going to knit the weekend hat with this for my mom because she really likes this lavender and I really want to knit her like a more decorative hat. I knitted her the classic ribbed beanie last year, but it's, you know, it's a ribbed beanie, but I think the, the cables would look pretty interesting. So that's what I want to do for this. Um, and then also the other yarn that I bought was with the goal of making a Chinese New Year sweater. 
So I mentioned last year that I really enjoyed knitting the red Laolu shawl for as my Chinese Chinese New Year cast on. And this year I think I'll make a pair of red socks. I'm pretty sure I'll use the Santa's Garden Sisu that I have in stash um, in red and then knit the Erica socks from the 52 Weeks of Socks book. But then I also wanted to have like a red sweater to wear on Chinese New Year. And I was thinking about what I wanted to make with, uh, like what I wanted to wear. And one of the main criteria is that it's not too hot because usually you're inside, like it's in February or January, depending on the year. This year it's in February. And typically you're inside, you're cooking and it's hot. And so I didn't want anything too bulky or too warm. I also really wanted something that's like pretty ornate and, decor and intricate and like have a lot of decorative stuff going on. And so my first thought, uh, not my first thought, the, the idea that I had when I made this acquisition that I'm about to show you is the Euless Gunser by Euless Gunser by Sandiskarn. It's a single stranded mohair uh, lace yoke uh, garment. It's kind of like a similar vibe to the Ranunculus, but obviously the yoke is a little bit different and it's um, the pattern itself specifically calls for one strand of mohair and it's not on its open of a gauge so it's a little bit translucent but not like super duper transparent and I wanted it in a red and I wanted to use my favorite mohair which is Knitting for Olive. And so I have been eyeing the pomegranate color for a really long time. I'd seen it once at my local yarn store. They had it in a heavy merino and I think it complements my skin really well so I figured I would get the mohair and it came in the mail and this is what it looks like which unfortunately isn't quite what I expected. It's, I mean, it's a beautiful color. I think it's totally like my color palette. It's, I'd say like a muted orangey red. It's just unfortunately not a, what I was going for for a Chinese New Year sweater. I wanted it to be like more saturated and vibrant and festive. And this is more like a muted color. Um, when my boyfriend saw me opening this and being a little disappointed, he was like, well, I think you can make it work. It's like a rusty Santa something or other. And I was like, and I really appreciate you for trying, but I'm not going for Rusty Santa. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I don't think I will use this for the Eula Skenser. So then I was deciding like, well, first of all, what do I use this yarn for? And second of all, what do I make for my Chinese New Year uh, cast on, like Chinese New Year outfit? And so I have two ideas. One idea is to just get the Knitting for Olive soft silk mohair in the color Red Current and use that to make the Eula Skensa as I previously have planned and then save this for something else. Or I can just maybe get the like Merino in pomegranate and then knit something for the Chinese New Year with this mohair plus the Merino. Cause I think the Merino is a lot more vibrant and when it's held together, it doesn't look muted like this. So yeah, the ideas I had was like maybe a, like a lacy cardigan. Like I could even make another Joya cardigan with this mohair and this uh, merino, so like this fabric, but in this color. And that is at once like decorative, it's red, it shouldn't be too warm, probably. And it also is something I can easily wear in regular day-to-day -day life. Whereas I think the Eula Skensa, because it's translucent and more of a statement, I'm not sure if it has as much wearability, so that's one option, or Sari Nordland has some lacy cardigan patterns, especially the Kutar cardigan I think looks quite nice, so I could make a lacy red cardigan in pomegranate like that. Um, yeah, or just stick to my bright red Eulis Gunza plan, and then maybe save this for the Gia zipper sweater, because I have been wanting to knit that as well, and I think this with maybe the heavy merino in pomegranate could look pretty nice. My one concern is how warm that's going to be, because if it's too warm, I probably won't be able to wear it very often in the climate that I live in, so... That's kind of the decision paralysis that I'm undergoing. Luckily, I know I like the pomegranate color, so I'm sure I'll use it for something else, but just not totally sure what just yet. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. <laughs> okay, so the last thing that I'll end on is my stitch marker advent. Um, this is something that was a surprise gift from my boyfriend, which I was really appreciative of. So I had never like opened an advent calendar. I've never had an advent calendar before. I didn't grow up celebrating Christmas, but my boyfriend did and he loves advents. Um, so this year he surprised me with a stitch marker uh, advent, which is such a nice gift um, and very me. So I am really excited about it. We've been opening these together. So I think I showed you the first one, which was a butterfly. I think I forgot to show you the second one from yesterday, which was this star and I put it on the um, Seaway pullover. So let's see, can you see the, can you see that? <laughs> I 
it's a star. Once again, I've attached it to a light bulb marker to make it like a progress keeper, but you know, that's what that is. So I guess like you can also see like how much progress I made in one day, which I think is a little bit ridiculous, but I just really wanted to finish it. So I made, made a lot of progress here, but anyway, maybe we can open the third day today. So let's see. If you have, this should be coming out after December 1st. I don't think I'm gonna edit it today, so it shouldn't be a spoiler. So I'm gonna open it. Ooh, oh, nice. This one is a um, progress keeper. That's awesome. You can see that it's a, a cute little gold butterfly. Can you see that? That's super cute. So yeah, I don't know if I mentioned, this is from a company called Firefly Notes. I think you found it on Etsy and it's from Richmond, BC. So this one, um, the description is, this year's Firefly Note Stitch Marker Advent Calendar for Knitters is a tribute to the fairy world and celestial night sky. Each enamel charm on the end of your marker has been lovingly custom designed and made to add a little magic to your projects. On each of the 25 days you open the little fairy doors, um, you will discover one of 20 round stitch markers and five progress keepers. All charms are unique to this year's calendars. Ah, so there's gonna be primarily stitch markers, but also some progress keepers. That's super exciting. Yeah, so I will be continuing to opening this and I'm, I'm really excited to have this. If you are also doing advent calendars, whether it's knitting themed or not, I hope you also have um, an exciting time opening them as the month goes on. So yeah, that's everything that I had to share um, for today. So I hope you all are doing well. And if you made it this far, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I started these podcasts because I really liked watching them and having someone to hang out with while I knit. So I hope that you had some fun working on some projects while watching this episode. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you again very soon. Bye everyone.